ladies and gentlemen. Hello. Welcome to the most must-see show on the Johnners Podcasting Network. Welcome to Such Good Shoot. And tonight we are shooting with the legendary Mike Kyoto. What's happening, guys? How you doing, brother? Thanks for having me on tonight, man. What's up, oh. Isaac, Dozer, Shane? What's Idiot. going Thanks on, man? It's nice a pleasure to have you, man. This is like truly uh, cool, an man. honor and I'm really excited to talk and, you know, just sort of pick your brain a little on yeah, uh, cool, man. a different a different aspect of the business that a lot of people sort of, you know, like, especially when, when, when you're doing your job right, you know, you're, you're not noticed for the most part, you know, True. so uh, yeah, it's really an honor to have you here. And, uh, you know, I just want to, I just want to start. I just want to ask, uh, you're, you're a Jersey, you're a Jersey boy. Yeah. Dirty Jersey boy. That's it, man. I was, <laughs> what was uh, I was born in Bayonne, uh, New Jersey, 66, and then uh, we Bayonne. moved up. Bayonne? Oh, yeah. shit. Yeah, I've got so. a good friend in Bayonne. They're really cool, <laughs> yeah. man. That's yeah, a so Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles Secrets <laughs> of the Ooze. <laughs> yeah. That's where the ooze, that's, <laughs> and it, that ties into wrestling, too, with Kevin Nash. Yeah. So. <laughs> yeah, right, right. <laughs> but, um, yeah, I mean, my family, we moved up uh, in 1974. We moved up to South Jersey. It was, like, moving across, you know, to a whole nother ball game moving outside of Philadelphia and growing up in South Jersey. So, you know, coming from the city, it's almost basically living in New York City, living in Bayonne, you know, so. Yeah, yeah, it's close. But yeah, it's cool now. And then I moved out uh, some years ago, I moved out to Houston, Texas uh, for about 14 years and uh, I'm here in Tampa, Florida now. So nice Tampa, Florida, palm trees and nice beaches. So there you go. Yeah. Not better not beaches than Jersey. Yeah. You got that right. <laughs> That's the truth. Well, I mean, and, and, you know, you've, you've had, uh, I guess the privilege of getting to travel basically fucking everywhere. Yeah. Fucking everywhere, bro. <laughs> and, I mean, you're talking like, uh, I've been to over 60 different countries and a lot of countries over and over and over. Um, and all throughout a lot of the countries in Europe, Europe and stuff like that, Japan for over 30 something years, been going there every time we went there, I was in Japan. So, um, yeah, it's, it's been, a, it's been a quite experience all throughout the United States, all yeah. throughout driving the trucks and setting up the ring with Tony Chimmel. And, uh, you know, we drove the trucks all over through Canada and a lot of places. So it's, it's been an experience, man. I mean, no, so you definitely, not. you definitely got like, you're like, okay, now I, I've been all over. I know where I want to go now. <laughs> oh, yeah. That's the truth, yeah. yeah awesome. Bucket list is already there, you know, and, and now I'm doing it. I'm doing it, going to be doing it more for vacation, you know, and just yep. uh, be able to spend more time with joy. Yeah, yeah, so what, what's your uh, what's your, uh, you know, fa favorite country to visit? Um, you know what I mean? Um, in, in wrestling or, or by yourself? By, by myself, you know, I'd say Spain, Australia. Australia is probably their number one, man. Aussie. Wow. Australia, New Zealand, that's that's fantastic out there. Beautiful. Melbourne and Sydney are some, some awesome cities there, cool. you know. Um, Tokyo, Japan, for certain reasons. There's so many countries for so certain reasons. Cultures and this and food and party and lifestyle and everything. I mean, you know, I remember back in the day going to the Philippine Islands. That was a fucking, that was a trip, bro. <laughs> <laughs> you, want, you want to talk about picking like, you know... <laughs> I'll take number two, or I'll take N10, and then I'll take N22. And <laughs> it's just if you know what I'm talking about. Oh, oh yeah. I? Yeah. I'll take those numbers, too. I don't care. Yeah, <laughs> I, I, yeah man, I got some great pictures with um, God. Uh, it was Rikishi some back in the day, man, when he was young. And, Salt, uh, the Sultan there. Tonga, yeah, it was Tonga, Haku. And... Um, from the Philippine Islands, you know, with a bunch of girls in a strip club one night and all that. So I, I mean, I find some cool shit in the last year and a half. I've been digging through all my stuff, you know. You get, you actually get a little Man. bit of time to. I mean, 30, 31 years of basically well, yeah, you never, you never. I mean, did you like how? What was the longest break you you took in that time? Well, I was thirty five years um, full time. I yeah. just I started. I debuted in TV with, with uh, refereeing in like eighty nine. I want to say. So I started refereeing like in 87 and everything. That's why, like, basically I debuted in 89. So it was really more 31 years of debuting as a referee on TV. Yeah. And that's why I got a shirt for 31 years or this and that. And so, you know, it's, it's 35 years with the company because I started on the ring crew. So and it, yeah. I, I actually worked for Gorilla Monsoon. Well, you um, you live near him? Like, yeah. How I, it was five minutes. You know, with Willingboro, New Jersey, I was five minutes from him. 
So I grew up with Joey and his sister, Valerie Morella, you know, Joey was yeah. you know, really good friends of mine. So, and uh, before he passed, God bless. And, uh, you know, so that's how I, I started doing wrestling. But when I was 15 in the summertime, you know, 16, worked with Victor Quiones at, that ran the ring crew for Gorilla Monsoon because everybody had a certain territory before Vince took over everything. Because, you know, Vince Sr., I was working for it, like actually working for Gorilla, but Gorilla was working for Vince Sr. That's when Bruno had his territory in Pennsylvania, Pittsburgh. Jersey was Gorilla to Salisbury, Maryland, Philadelphia, and all that. And I used to do ring crew and set up the ring, take robes. Joey never wanted to sell programs. And I was like, fuck, I got to sell fucking programs. <laughs> I went out, I'd go, I'd get 50 bucks for each job, you know, about 75 for the ring, 50 bucks for robes, 50 bucks for for jackets and 50 bucks for timekeeping or playing music during the show. So you got paid individually. Arnie Skoll would sit there with a big briefcase of money, fucking a Halliburton, and just pay out the cash what you did for the night. Wow. Then I'd go sell programs, right? So I'd go sell fucking, and I'd go, how much am I making on the fucking programs, Vic? And it was Joey didn't want to sell them. Tony didn't want to sell them. Joey was a referee at the time, so he wasn't, you know? So uh, I was like, all right, well, how much? He was like, oh, I was, it's 10 cents off the dollar. I wound up selling like 1,500, 2,000, 3,000 programs in Philadelphia Spectrum, Salisbury, Maryland, when we used to do that. Like, um, Allen, I mean, uh, Wildwood, New Jersey, we used to do the convention center and held 1,500 people. You know, Andre would be on the card, Rick Martell, Tony Gurria, fucking Paul Rowe, you know, whatever. But uh, Jim Powers. You know, but uh, I would sell 3,000 programs on the boardwalk, a buck a piece with a card in You know, the one bullshit little card with eight matches, you know. I'd make 500 bucks a night, bro. I had four wow. cars by the time I was 17. I mean, that's so, um, that's yeah, better so, money than some of the wrestlers on the bro, card were making. <laughs> in, 19, in 1983, 82. Most and, of them, know, yeah. You know, so, and I did that for a couple of years. In the summertime, I did it a lot because I was off from school. And then I would do it sometimes on the weekends when it was local. You know, and just take the trip Friday night, come back Sunday night late, and go back to school Monday, but in high school. But uh, so I did a lot in the summer times, but I made a lot of money doing it, man. You know, so it was, I knew it was good when I, you know, I didn't want to go play baseball and shit like that. So I just uh, went another way with my career and went into wrestling, man. So I was kind of intrigued by Hulk Hogan and all that shit, you know, starting out there. That's, yeah, yeah that's, I can see why it would be a, a fascinating business. And if you're seeing that kind of money at such a young age, especially at that time, like, yeah, it was, yeah. It's, my, I, it's yeah, easy my, to get hooked. <laughs> it, was, it was hooked. It was, got hooked and then you got hooked into the, what you were doing too, because it was just easy cash. It was fun. You know, you spend a weekend on the road or sometimes you do a few, three or four or five days on the road back then, you know, with doing a certain territories that Gorilla had, you know, it was pretty cool, man. So, I mean, and, you know, traveling with Joey and Tony Chimmel and a buddy of our, Kevin Means, used to do the ring crew back then. But, you know, I know it was good money, but my dad got sick in 84. So he took a master stroke and I went back into wrestling because I knew I wasn't going to proceed my baseball career after that. Mm -hmm. And then, so I just needed to make some more money and Gorilla got me set back up. You know, Joey did too. So it was cool. And yeah, Joey trained you to, uh, to be a referee. Yeah. yeah, he helped a lot. Definitely, man. Oh, yeah. Gorilla gave me all the words of wisdom. Don't be a stooge in this business. <laughs> <laughs> Like you said, and refereeing is longevity in his business. You know, forget being a fucking wrestler, but yet going in there taking bumps. You can have a good five, 10, 15 career, five, 10 good career, but most of these guys don't have that long of a span of a career. Only very few guys in the business will have a very long span in the business, you know? And it's being true. a ref's kind of like being a kicker in football. Yeah, just need it, right? Just need it. So, I mean, you know, the longevity of being a referee without taking bumps and, you know, a wrestler can have a good five-year run with a title. I mean, well, these days, six months or a year, but or a couple months with a title. They change so much. But, you know, having so much longevity as a referee is just definitely a lot less toll on your body, taking bumps and traveling yeah. every freaking night. Because, you know, that's why a lot of wrestlers back then got hooked on pills and pain pills and shit like that, you know. And you also don't have to worry about, being the one who's selling tickets and if you're not drawing you're not performing you're not making money right is you know like if you're doing a great job and you know you're you're going to make money you're going to continue to do but you don't have to be the one who's yeah responsible for the draw and i, I does that does that give you a different sense of uh yeah, well, that's that's the thing, though, always when we learn, Isaac, is, you know, back in the day, that's the things that Chief J. Strombo, Gorilla Monsoon, referees, 
don't sell tickets. They comp tickets. That's what we do. That's my best motto. I love that too. So, <laughs> you know, they good. always said, you know, as the old school, like Pat Patterson, Gorilla Monsoon, and Chief Chase Trombo, Rene Goulet, Jack Lonza, all the agents I was growing up to at that time in my career, um, Grizzly Smith. They always said, man, he said, if the less the referee is noticed, you know, the more the referee is doing his job. And that's, you know, it really is, it, it is true. It is true. And I've learned that throughout my career, you know, and you take a lot of, and that's what I did, man. I took a lot of wisdom, words of wisdom from Gorilla Monsoon and a lot of old school. And I was, I was, I was coming up from the best era from the eighties to the nineties, to the attitude era. It's just, you know, it's uh, I don't think we'll ever get those kind of years back. In the yeah. Business. And I mean, nah. <laughs> What I mean, so the changes over the those decades too. I mean, when when you first get into the business as a referee, I mean, even right. you know when you're first on TV, I mean, how different was it from even late '90s, early 2000s? Um, it was a big difference because here you went into like you know I got I remember God I just gave away I found a bunch of posters man in 1997. You know, um, with Brett and Brett and Taker were going at it, you know, a lot of stuff. And I got some stuff from Brett and uh, Brett over. It's like some pictures where Brett, I'm in the ring. We're in South Africa. It was like 1997, right before the screw job was coming up, you know. So, and it was like, God, I look at this. It was a front page of an article of Cape Town, South Africa. It's probably right here with a light shining on it. Like, let me see. Yeah. My camera. It's yeah. right uh in the back back to my left Man. but um so and at the time uh yeah and you had taker and brett working together then brett didn't like the way the business was going in the attitude era he didn't like it for his kids he had you know he had a lot of kids at that time um he didn't like it you know watching kids he didn't like to portray that kind of stuff on tv where Shawn michael was going to be their rising star you know what i'm saying so, and we had so much freaking talent back then, man. You got to think, Stone Cold fucking Steve Austin, this one race. I mean, it it was, no, the roster, I mean. The roster was just stacked. You, you think about, you think about the mid-carters. Right. Of that era, and you're like, right. yeah. this guy's like D'Lo Brown and like, shit. Right, it's right, like, right. Those I guys know. are incredible. Right, right. I mean, we had, you had a stacked card all the way through the show, yeah. you know. So, I mean, going through that era, just seeing the way the era changed and, you know, then they, they fucked over Brett, Brett got screwed, you know, whatever. And, and it kind of sucked for Brett because he went on to WCW and they really didn't do much with him, man. He didn't really? last long there in his career. They dropped the shit. ball. I mean, they so, should have yeah. had him on the, the next fucking week. Right. I mean, I think. Or the Brett next night. 15 got- years, 15 years with the WWF back then, you know, WWE when when he was uh you know screwed over and i know it's at least 15 years yeah yeah it's been a long a long run yeah because i mean i know him for like a 12 years at that point you know or something when you know yeah and yeah. i mean because we we actually just one of the one of the we review we're reviewing the pay-per-views from 97 and we just did the canadian stampede right and you know fantastic show but right. you know the the way it right. ends you know is like such a bittersweet moment you know going oh, back and watching it with the whole this yeah. art family in there yeah. you know and knowing that like you know within a month things just start falling apart and it's you know like it's it was really nice to see but at the same time you're like fuck no yeah, it was it was it was it was brutal because you know he was a guy that, and then what happened to owen not too long after that you know it was just all went down to shits but then um you know then going into the attitude era you had the rock stone cold you know, even going into after like 9 11, 2002, when we had WrestleMania in Toronto Sky Dome with Rock and Hogan, that was fucking absolutely wow. phenomenal. You had Icon against Icon. Yeah. You know, fucking Hogan basically passes the fucking torch. So, well, in the beginning, you would have Hogan getting the torch pass from Andre the Giant, which Joey was the referee. A very big match there he did. Um, and then, and then you had finally Hogan passing the torch to The Rock you know, against another icon and then fucking rock takes the torch and then he takes off the Hollywood. 
<laughs> pretty much and, after that. Yeah. <laughs> like he, he sort of came back and gave it to wow. Cena, but I mean, it didn't yeah. really. No, he went over on Cena the first time. The first time. And yeah. then I guess. Then he, ripped yeah. his, then he ripped his oh. pectoral muscle off. Her. <laughs> well, yeah. Right. Well, he, he Casino was fucking buttered. I had that first one, you know, and uh, Rock was going over. And I was wondering who the fuck was going to go over. Cena had been running the road for 10 years. Rock's been fucking in Hollywood, you know. And then all of a sudden they say, oh, John, you got to do the job. <laughs> and they built that one for, a, that was the one they built for a year. Yeah. Right. Yeah, and then it, was, it was in Miami. Yeah. I think it was, that one was in Miami. Yeah. And uh, because I had that, and I said, you know, it just, I said, damn, I said, I can't believe it. I stand, they gave it to The Rock, and I love The Rock, don't get me wrong. I felt bad for Cena, you know, he, he had it, you know, because I knew he was kind of pussy, like sour pussed about it, you know. And um, I he's mean, busting his ass for a decade, why, like, yeah. You know, I mean, there was that was the thing about that, the whole build for that is that it, right. it, the what Cena was doing always felt authentic, you, right? You know, the shit he was saying, right? You could, you could tell there was some, some True. anger and some resentment there, right? Right, because, promos, yeah, yeah, because you know, like obviously it was, you know, like the best stuff is always a little real, you yeah, know? <laughs> yeah. I mean, it was, and then you know, and it's like. Okay, then they set the second one up, and then of course you're gonna know Cena's gonna get it back, and it's like that was kind of like, uh, you know, but uh, yeah. and you know it's and then like and believe me, Rock was a star, but he wasn't as big as a star then as he is now. Yeah, you know, yeah, I mean, yeah not even close. And I mean, Rock's still... fucking twice the size. <laughs> he's fucking jacked. It's insane how big it's he is, insane, bro. He works out to <laughs> that. Oh yeah, you know, and I'm sure uh, you know whatever, but <laughs> Brock, Brock is another big motherfucker too. Hell yeah, hell yeah. I mean, I, I remember oh. his match, his match against Angle, where you know he does the shooting star press, and you know, like, oh. and mm -hmm. and like anyone else is is their neck is broken, and he bounced, he just bounced. <laughs> he was he was fucked up though, man. He, he oh was, yeah, he yeah. was dazed. His eyes were so oh, red. He was he was, was gone, gla but his I mean, eyes glazed. And, but um, like just having a neck the size of a truck tire. You that's know? what saved him. <laughs> yeah. That's what yeah. literally saved him. His traps probably and all that stuff, man. Yeah. Because, man, bro, he and he's athletic as can be, man. He is athletic. And mm -hmm. I know he can come off. I've seen him do that. That finish so many times. You know, he didn't do it every week or every – He only no. up, But when he did, he executed that some bitch. Yeah. But I knew when anger was out that far, I was going, holy fuck. And I'm thinking – I hope he's gonna get him here, you know, and he didn't, man. It was just like, oh That's, man, I, I, I thought he almost broke his neck at that point. Yeah, I'm sure. I mean, that must have been, yeah, that must have been a scary moment yeah. for you, and yeah. I'm sure whoever's in your ear at that point is, yeah, yeah and, you, know. you know, and and all credit to both Angle and Lesnar yeah. for being able to pull out that F5 and 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 make it look decent. Yeah, I mean, yeah. like the fact that Lesnar was able to even stand up. I know, bro. That. Strong dude, man. But He's yeah, why? Well, um, I'm curious. Uh, going, sort of talking again about, uh, you know, early in the in the business and being a ref. I mean, was it? Is it at that point? And I don't know if it's still like this so much, at least in WWE. But was there like in MLB and like in baseball? Is there like a separation of the referees from the wrestlers? Um. And yeah, any in any time where you would be seen by anybody who wasn't in the business, um, you or mean is that like not? The, what do you mean, like, like the referees being separate? Like yeah, like like I, I, with with uh, with baseball, like the the umpires and the players aren't allowed to like associate for oh, you know, travel, yeah. you know, or yeah, travel together, be like hang out together because of all the yeah. the yeah. Like, drinking beers, yeah, yeah the, the scandals. <laughs> and I'm just I just was curious if you know to help protect. You know the business as a whole it used to be that the you know the heels and the faces weren't allowed to be seen together and i was right. just curious if there right. was anything like that with the referees whereas like the refs travel together they don't they're not seen at the bars with the boys like things like that or if it no. was a lot looser no it was we mixed up a lot i mean the only thing they didn't want us doing you know it's like when you as a referee the boys can get out and get fucked up out of control but when the ref one of the referees got fucked up out of control you got more heat you know what I'm saying? Because they always considered the refs not one of the boys, you know? Yeah. But I used to travel with wrestlers my whole life. I mean, it was Tony Chimmel in the truck for many, many years, 20-something years. Yeah. And then um, 
right before Jim Ross left, you know, he made me definitely the head referee and stuff like that. So, and that was awesome. And, you know, he, they wanted, they were moving me up and, and then Earl moving, I was kind of, you know, I still were doing, was doing great matches, even in my younger career, because yeah. I was getting asked for, and I was called in for, for the talent, from production, you know, because your referees are made up and they ask the talent, who do you want as your referee? Who do you want this? So a lot of, and, you know, they would put me in like Michael Hayes production guy. I mean, he's the head, you know, man and certain you know people that did that stuff in pay-per-views or, you know, it was, and it was to the talent, the talent, mostly the talent would appoint me to these matches That's and cool. say, we want Kyoto, like Rock and Hogan. Rock wanted me to do his match. Hogan was like, hell yeah, I love Coyote to do my match. He was like, you know, so, I mean, <laughs> it's pretty damn cool. I mean, it's, it's that's cool. yeah. It's I mean, feeling. is, is there any, higher you know show of respect to have yeah, yeah you know what like you were saying at the beginning you know like hogan being one of the guys who like was drew you into this business in the first place being yeah there. i mean he sure you know, did what? because like you know he was selling out houses left and right you know and i mean he was you know he was doing a cartoon he was on tv all the time you know he, he, yeah he was huge. you know it was like dude i've never seen Little kids used to cry and through the barricades when we used to have the regular bicycle barricades. Kids and little kids would be tearing when he's selling. And that's all really Hogan did was sell. And then he'd come back with about three or four or five moves, right? Drop and the leg. You, <laughs> yeah. boom, boom, you know, a couple punches, this, whatever. Throw you in a rope, drop the leg, you know, hit the leg or the boot. It's just, but it was fun shit. And it was just, it was awesome. I mean, Hogan. We always you know, knew Hogan was over in the north, and a lot of places in the south, it was always Ric Flair, you know? Yep. So yeah. that's it was a competition. That was a competition there, you know? So you can, you can imagine. Re relating to the wrestlers asking for different refs for different matches and all, watching these 1997 matches, and to a lesser extent, AEW now, it seems like the refs have a little discretion to go not as strict with the rules is that told to you or was that truly your opinion at that moment no nah, they're um aw uh we're comparing AWWE pretty much i mean AEW's rules with the refs i can't it's hard for me to watch it i want to i'm gonna see i want to watch it because you want to definitely want to see cm punk i'm going to be out in chicago coming up soon you know that weekend with pay-per-view at AEW. so um i got some podcasts out there going on nice. with ad free and then uh so I'll be I'll be at the show too Sunday backstage. So anyway, but AEW I think is, is starting to boom, man. You know, and they're starting to build a roster where with AEW you got the referees are just not doing shit. I, I want me to go back to referees because you know I watch it, I watch the show, and it's just hard to watch as a referee when they're just we're sitting there and you're just acknowledging the, the tag and but you're not acknowledging the five count out of the corner. You're not, not the five count off the ropes. And not even acknowledging the 10 counts pretty much really it's basically count a false finish or count the finish and just make the acknowledgement to a tag i've seen a couple bumps yeah. over there a couple of the guys at AEW took the referees and it was like oh my god it just looked it's hard to watch that show with the referees you know huh. and Aub aubrey does a great job she does a great job she she sells every little motion you know what i'm saying if you watch her, she sells every little spot, every little. It just, to me now, when I'm watching a match, I'm watching Aubrey because she's so much all over the place, you know. And I'm like, God, this girl's got so much talent. She can, you know. Yeah. You know, so if she didn't sell every little bit, you know. But uh, just yeah, so referee, just try not to be so much of a character in the ring, you know. So, and that's what we did in WWE. We made it where, you know, you had rules. The only thing I didn't like is when Vince cut her fucking names off, you know, and he like he heard some referee's name years ago, man, on the just being announced on the commentating. And he said, who the fuck is this guy? And they said, it's the referee, Vince. Well, why the fuck am I hearing his fucking name? God damn it. You know, he's like, <laughs> that's it. I don't want to hear any more fucking referee's names. And I'm like, what? And, but they'd still plug my name once in a while. But, yeah. Um, but they weren't allowed to. They but then stopped. they would do the shit like they did to fucking poor Tim White with that fucking no oh, yeah. jeez that yeah. suicide storyline and shit. And it's I know, like, I know the poor guy fucking literally like basically 
broke himself for them. I, and, yeah, and I know. I, he did. Man, I love Tim White, man. He's a great guy. Yeah, you know? I mean, you see, yeah. like it. Um, Shane, you were you were you were talking to before about about something that's similar to this, though, and in, in the idea of having referees that are are basically becoming famous. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you've got referees like 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 uh, Red Shoes over in New Japan and and Aubrey, obviously AEW, right? Um, you know Earl, whatever. You know referees that like everyone knows their name, yourself included. Um, right, and, and and sometimes you get um, you know sometimes you start watching like you said earlier with Aubrey, you know these 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 referees, um, you know kind of more more than the match. And I think you already answered it earlier, um, but. Uh, your your job as a referee is is to do less and and you know be be like, do more and be noticed less I guess yeah, I mean, is, is is there a situation when it's kind of cool when like a referee is 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 more noticed like um I, well, I and it's and it is cool because I'm gonna I didn't mean to cut you off Shane um, hold on are you finished or oh no 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 I said all good man Go I'm ahead. sorry yeah like it's really cool and you know like. I don't know if uh, you ever heard of it. Like, you know, start they start the Mike Kyoto chant at TV sometimes. And they started that after WrestleMania. Fuck, that was so fucking cool. Randy and Orton, Randy Orton, I remember at the Meadowlands. It was right after WrestleMania. The European crowd was there, most of them. And they start chanting. They always chant. And they fucking come up with new shit. And then it sticks to on TV for a while, yeah. you know? So they came up. And then Randy Orton and Sheamus were for, Fucking wrestling and fucking two oh, game faces. God, they got bored of the match and they started chanting my name. That was such a great it. moment. Randy just looked at me. He's like, "What the fuck?" And I'm like, <laughs> "Dude, I don't know." I, I'm like, "Is this a Jersey crowd?" Where I'm like, "This is my hometown." I'm like, <laughs> "I think it's a fucking European crowd." That was a, like, that was yeah. that was such a fun show. And I mean, it was just like. Yeah, I, I feel like that was like the first po like res raw after WrestleMania where the crowd really just hijacked the show the whole. Yeah, oh, well, that was the Fandango always... raw after. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. So I mean, that was pretty cool because like Randy thought it was because I was from Jersey, which you know Meadowlands is yeah 15, 20 minutes from Bayonne. He always knew that, you know. <laughs> and I lived close there, and he's like, "What the fuck is this? Your hometown? You got all these comp tickets out?" <laughs> And I'm like, dude, I don't fucking know, but I'm loving it. But like, I couldn't tell it. I couldn't acknowledge a crowd really because I didn't want to keep chanting it. And Vince would probably been pissed. But everybody popped them in the back, like Vince and everybody. It was just, but it's a good, it's a good moment to be recognized. And you know, and they're building Aud Aubrey and doing a great job with her because that's Chris Jericho's referee, you know. Yeah. And uh, I, I wish I was at AEW right now training these guys, you know. So. They yeah, need to I mean, I, I, mean, I, know I, I know I could help. You know, I feel do like they uh, have, do they have someone for that? Like, no, bro. Wow. No, I mean, which referee you can tell me you think that's training another referee there? Like, there isn't. There's no other referees. Um, Cody wanted to be strong, and there was a lot of guys pushing for me. Taz, Jim Ross, this one, um, a ton of guys. I couldn't even I go down a list of guys or Jake Hager. That's I travel with good friends and. Yeah. A lot of guys are like, and just Tony Khan's not high on referees, bro. I mean, he didn't want me there to train him. Like he wanted, Cody wanted me to do a lot of pay-per-views, you know, and, and stuff like that. And I know he was high on a hog, but somebody exonated after like three shows. That was it. it. It adds something to a big match to have a ref that is well-known and right. it's a highlight. Right. And, and that's what Cody wanted. Cody wanted that. I know yeah. that. I mean, there's a reason why, you know, like in, in New Japan, Red Shoes is doing the big matches, you know? Like, right. Or, you know, Earl Earl Hebner is doing those, or you're doing them, you know? Like, right, right. It, it adds, and, and I think that's the thing is, you know, like, if the thing about a good referee and, and getting back to that is, you know, you're, what you're doing is so much more than what you actually make it look like you're doing. Right, 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 and and you know, I think a lot of people don't fully understand. Can you just talk a little bit about, um, especially in the in the production, the TV production era, where mm -hmm. you know you have you know a whole van, you know, a whole truck full of people. You have a you know a gang of people at Gorilla. 
what is what is your role what is going you know like from from the, the time you know you get out to that ring and the introductions go what's going into your ear what do you have to be well, worried about for? yeah and like what do you what um, do you have to what is like you know like what are your roles in, in during that whole section other than counting to three and reacting to stuff you know and and and, and being the referee because right. it's it's so much more than than just that part of it right um there's there's a ton for a referee to do it as you're going in you have to hold you should know the whole if it's an important long match okay you should know everything in that match you know if it's a 30 25 30 minute match 35 minute match or four more you got to know a lot of shit you got to know false finishes heat spots um you know you got to give cues certain cues you got to give times going into breaks on live tvs you got to time give time and stuff in cues and tell them we're two minute commercial picture picture do this we're coming back fucking live we're coming back okay five seconds five four and then they'll start getting back up out of a hold coming back up on live tv okay we're back and you know, we action action you know and like we got to get right into action again um there's 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 a lot of things that you're passing on simple cues to the boys coming from fucking gorilla because billy's in your ear the agents in your ear like over the IFB and then you know Vince is into the Billy Kidman's ear and then he's into my ear but then I'm you know one and then the boys one of the boys may be calling a spot to me verbally then I got to pass it on to him you know change a spot up do this do that you know uh whether it's a hip toss do this or drop kick me when I come here when I turn around tell him that you know it's just referees and then you got to figure out like, then you got to worry about if you have to take a bump in that match <laughs> you got to be there at the right time, the right spot, the right placement. And it's got to look good because if it looks like shit, it really kills a fucking match when a referee takes a shitty bump. Or like when a guy whiffs him and he takes the bump anyway. Oh, yeah. I've seen that on TV. I went, oh. I've seen <laughs> what, what, <laughs> speaking of which, what, honestly, what's your opinion of the ref of the ref bump and like you, you get knocked over the ring and then you have to lay there for – Four, yeah, four minutes, four, five, six, 20, yeah. 40 minutes. Yeah, it seems like a lifetime, man. It's just, yeah. and it's, it's weird because, and every bump is different because you'll take, if you have to come back in a few minutes or five minutes to finish the match, you're not going to take a very heavy bump from a wrestler. If it's something really bad, it should put you out for the rest of the night. You know, then another yeah. referee might come down or he may come back at the end. But, um, you know, it's a lot of different situations, you know, going into taking a bump, how you're going to represent if he's going to get thrown over the top rope, he's not coming back. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Into that match. It's just too big of a bump for a rep to come back. Yeah. So there's gotta be certain little bumps that you take, but I mean, you know, over my career, he's taken many, many bumps, you know, and you just got to make sure it looks good, man. Cause it's, it's a lot of stress on you because if it don't, the referee looks like shit. And if it's the referee's fault, you know, you're really up to Shit's Creek. You know, you yeah. fucked up your one little spot you had. You know, <laughs> yeah. these guys got 30 minutes of spots, 40 minutes of spots, and you fuck up one bump. You know, what I'm I uh, I was watching your your uh, the invasion the invasion uh, angle match that you had your three on three match with uh, Rock and Jericho with the Dudleys. Oh and yeah, Nick Patrick. Yeah, and you took a you took a fucking bump from uh, oh from Bubba. Bubba. Oh, he, Bubba ripped my Jesus brother. That, that's a story behind that, man. There's a story behind that. What did you do to that man? <laughs> Didn't do fucking anything. <laughs> Bubba's like, Bubba's like all day. Him and Devon. I love Bubba and Devon, you know, funny fucking guys. But Bubba's like, Kyoto, he was like, You don't sell that fucking clothesline. And if you notice, I fucking sold that shoulder all the way through. <laughs> you did. No, you were even when you were trying to get up to get I know. Up. I fucking so. I'm sitting there and selling it too fucking much, worried about because he ripped my fucking head off, made it look great. And that's the thing, too. He goes, I'm gonna, I'm gonna try and bring that clothes on. Just be careful because I don't want to catch you on your fucking, you know, and I don't want to break your teeth or nothing. So don't, you know, don't cringe on me too much, you know. <laughs> so we're going over, and I'm like, that's cool, man. And he's like, You mind if I put it in a little bit? I said, No, fuck no, not at all. I mean, that's where you, <laughs> I wanted to, what am I gonna say? No, yeah. don't fucking lay no, it don't in. Don't you, don't you dare. Yeah, they, these guys are putting, <laughs> well, these guys are putting fucking guys, boys through the table left and right, and women, and everything else back in them days. You yeah, know May, May May Young. May Young. Oh yeah, remember that? <laughs> yeah, I mean, if Jesus you if you're Christ. not gonna take if you're not gonna take 
yeah, if May Young's going to take that table bump, and you, right, what are you going to say? As a yeah, referee? you can't, you can't I don't say no. Take that fucking bump. <laughs> no, not a chance. You want to eat? No. <laughs> yeah, you're going to get hit twice as hard. So I sold that motherfucker all the way back, and then uh, Bob was like, "Great fucking bump, bro!" Great. He goes, "Dude, you you oversold that fucking clothesline. You had to sell it that long." I'm like, <laughs> we sell it. Okay, I'm like, okay. <laughs> I'm like that actually hurt. I was like, yeah, it did. No, it did. It did I fucking bet. make my mood. It did. did bring it, man. That was, was that a cool match? Was that a fun match for you, brother? It, it's funny. I was just at the car dealership the other day. This kid, the salesman, kids comes running up. He's like, "Yo, are you, are you Mike Kyoto?" I'm like, "Yeah." I was like, "Damn, you got a pretty good fucking eye, bro." And he's like, "Oh man, I've been watching you. Thank you for all the years when I was a kid, man. Watching you, man. Growing up, watching you all the years." And he goes. This is my favorite match for you. And it was that match right there. <laughs> it was, it was, was like, fun. Me and my wife were like, holy shit. We were like, look at this kid. I good eye. I mean, he kind of see me in the, through the front windshield, you know? And I never even, <laughs> the kid that's, just started the job there. I didn't even know him. That's so, impressive. Yeah, I, that's, uh, I actually, uh, I posted on um, Nick Patrick's Facebook today. Oh, uh, did and you? I was like, yeah, I was like, I'm going to be, you know, talking to you. I'm going to ask about this match. Do you have any memories from the match? And this is his response, and I'm going to quote him. He says, Isaac, other than me whipping everyone, not really. <laughs> <laughs> well, if you talk to him again, tell him thanks for doing the job for me. Yeah. <laughs> I always appreciate it, man, because I know I was stiff on my shit. <laughs> uh, what was working with Nick like? He he seems He's like a, a cool dude, cat. Man. Yeah, he, is, he was always a cool, laid-back dude, man. Yeah. So uh, he was really cool, and I just had a podcast earlier tonight, and um, and they, his name got brought up. But we were talking about him, you know, and yeah, it's, somebody had asked a question like, "What referee could you have worked with more? Would you have liked to work with more?" It's a, I said, besides Joey Morella, you know, probably Nick Patrick. He was one of them we talked about, and I, you know, Nick's a cool guy, always laid back. Yeah, now, why did he ever leave the company? I couldn't remember. I d I don't know what happened there. Um, yeah, to I mean, be honest. Like, I didn't get it. You know, I didn't get it. I, I can't. I'm trying to rack my brain. I got to ask somebody why he left, like Charles Robinson or somebody. Yeah. But I don't know. What has he been doing? Anything or? Uh, not that. I mean, he, he's, I think he's from his Facebook. He's just, you know, just yeah, going I mean, and post, posting old stuff. I know, uh, I know Jody just passed away. So I think that's been sort of most have been the, a lot of, a lot of posts oh, wow. memories of Jody, but. Gotcha, gotcha, gotcha. Yeah, but yeah, I mean, what a yeah, I mean, what a legendary family. Yeah. I mean, that's yeah. it's it's yeah, it's cool to see that kind of um, like you know, with a match with with a guy who spent you know so long in WCW and was such right. an influential ref there right. and like, right. part of so many great stories. Yeah, yeah but and they like, were very involved. What's that? Yeah. I just said very involved, like yeah. Nick Patrick was on on the show itself. Right. Um, Good. Yeah, I mean, Good. he was he was such a character in WCW, and I think it was like, yeah, probably one of the first times that you know that the referee really became like a central figure. Yeah. yeah. More than just like you know the guy who was officiating the match, but. Oh yeah, um, that's that's the same thing when Earl, you know, when Earl came in, David Hebner used to referee a lot, you know, for us when we first, you know, when I was, you know, refereeing when I was young, and then Earl came and did that switch with Hogan, you know, that switch with with Dave Hebner, and you know the, you know, the thing with Hogan, man, that was yeah. that blew off the roof, you know, on that Saturday was, night event, okay. man. So that was that was cool, a cool, yeah, very cool. But you know, and I mean, we, you know, and like I said, like Joey Morelli did some really cool matches. He's he's done the, the Hulk Hogan. You know, Andre the Giant match. He's yeah. done the Brett the Hitman Hart and Davy Boy '92 in SummerSlam in fucking oh my London, God. London Stadium. That was badass. Yeah, you know. So it's especially just, considering uh, the the state that Davy Boy was in for that one. Yeah, yeah, right. So, so I mean, uh, you know, it was, it was good. Like you know, in all the matches with the ring collapse and that I've done with you know Big Show and Brock Lesnar and shit like that and. And all I do I had to do was sell. That's just sell my look. Like, what the fuck just happened? And they loved it backstage. Gorilla that Lord. was yeah, a great, great moment. Yeah, I mean, you, you know, know like, 
and uh, the Rock and Hogan match, and just a lot of member icon matches I've, I've done. Over you've done, years. yeah. I mean, you've you you know, made you main evented more than what two, yeah. what, three WrestleManias or something, four WrestleManias. Oh, we have like more that. than that. Yeah, yeah. I mean, a lot of main events for yeah. that. And, yeah. Um, do you have Do you have a favorite? Do you have a favorite match that you that you refereed? I mean, you know, like um, certain matches for different ways, like you know, certain matches for technical, like. I got to say, Rock and Hogan, Icon against Icon, was one of the best matches ever. Because working with Hogan throughout all those years, and he went WCW and then came back. Um, I have to say, Icon, Icon with him. Yeah, you know, there's many matches with John Cena I've done with, and you know, title matches and stuff over the years. But um, I mean, it's got to be Rock Hogan first. Kurt Angle, um, Shane McMahon is one of my most memorable matches too. Um, yes, that was a great match. You know, uh, the, are we talking King of the or King of the Ring? Yeah, there? it was King of the Ring. I think it was. There. Yeah, it was that was Angle? in the Meadowlands. That was actually in the Meadowlands too. Yeah. Did, <laughs> so I, did like what? Did you almost get fired for that? Did Vince almost murder you? Like Vince was fucking hot. He I was, mean that. Jesus Christ, brother. Man. So. I was on Kurt's right side, and it, the glass didn't break the first time, you know. And Shane, man, you know, this Shane had a lot to prove, you know. And me and Shane, you know, Shane went on the road with us for we became very good friends in the business, you know. And Shane had went on the road for a year with Tony Chimalai after he got out of college to learn everything about the ring, you know, from the down from the driving the trucks. He he went with us on the road driving the trucks, um, fucking. To every town, setting up the ring, tearing it down, doing all the shit work. He because his dad wanted him to know everything from the bottom all the way up to the top. How I refereed, how Tony rang announced, how this got set up, how how it worked. Yeah, I mean, I even yeah. remember he started, you know, as t on TV on commentary. Right, right, and you know, so you know, going going through all that with Shane and that night it was fucking he had so much to prove with kurt angle and Chris, here's this tough sum of bits and kurt was young and fucking in his prime and shane's a big boy and thick and strong man and, and he and he and he, he fucking kicked ass in that match but the second time he tried to put him through vince was screaming don't fucking do it again don't fucking do it again tell him not the fucking they kept screaming in my ear and I'm screaming, and they know I was screaming at Kurt, don't fucking do it, Kurt. And I'm on Kurt's, I think, right side of his ear. And I got back, and fucking Vince is pissed, but Shane was fine. He had glass through his hair. He had a lot of glass in his head still. And his a little head, concussion. Concussion, <laughs> I think he had. Um, yeah, he just, bro, it wasn't, that was just the one spot. I mean, Kurt fucking put him through the ring of yeah. that match, you know. Well, and that and, was the thing. It's like that match... I mean, for both of those guys, really like changed the trajectory of their careers. You yeah. know, like it, yeah. Kurt Angle wasn't like no one looked at him up until that point as like that badass and that tough. And no one, yeah. you know, like really had looked at Shane as being as like tough as he was up until well, that point. Yeah. And both of them, I mean, came out looking. Well, Shane came out looking better, man, even though he yeah. jobs. You know, I'm saying yeah. like, oh, 100%. You know, he got over more, I think, than ever after that match. Mm -hmm. He was starting to really get pushed, you know, big time. He, he went, he 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 went toe to toe with the, the fucking guy who won a gold medal with a broken freaking right? neck. Look, and, right, and he know, never like, should have stood a chance. I mean, it's a, it was a great story, a great yeah, match, great match, great story. So, I mean, and I told Curtis, Kurt, man, what the fuck is your right, eyebrows? Did you not hear me, man? They didn't want you to put him. He was. He goes, I was wondering what you're saying. I can't hear out of that side of the ear. And I'm like, what? I'm like, I never knew you can. He goes, yeah, it's, it's always been like that, Kyoto. I'm sorry, man. I was like, he's like, is he okay? I'm like, yeah, Shane's fine. I'm like, oh, shit, bro. I didn't know you couldn't hear out of that ear. I was wondering why. Why the fuck you're ignoring me, you know? I was like, it's coming from Vince. Vince is saying, no, fuck, don't fucking do it. This is coming from fucking Vince. You know, and I'm acting like I'm yelling at him. Because I really am. I was I was fucking definitely usually you're trying you're yelling at him, you act like you're yelling at him, but you're giving him cues. Yeah. You're giving him this time. time. You're doing this. Yeah, I was really fucking shooting on that one. That's for sure. That was a shoot. That this makes me think. So um they had oh, I think it was during the COVID, they had that match where was it was it 
Brock Lesnar and what was the one where they handcuffed the uh, Roman. Roman Roman Reigns and Kevin Owens and Kevin Owens yeah. Roman and Kevin Owens yeah. and gotcha. and they botched the key thing and there was a there was a it was a last man standing match right and, and they just stopped the 10 and they count. just stopped the 10 count <laughs> I did no, no 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 not you no. this was this was I think last year yeah this was last year probably after you got after your release but it was just like a really weird moment and I'm curious like as if like as a referee I know that like if something goes wrong you're supposed to count to three right so who would have, who would have went over Roman or uh <clears throat> Roman ended up going over, but he was handcuffed, and he was handcuffed. So Paulie Owens couldn't and, figure and out how to work ground. the key, and nobody thought to knock out the second ref they had already brought in. Oh no, shit! I was sorry. So I they, no, that. he yeah, started for, counting, and then like at five, just disappeared. The count stopped. That's because there was going to be a title switch then. Yeah, it a, it would have been who have been kept. Kept. Whoever Roman had, had the title. Roman had yeah. the title, and Kevin Owens would have won it on a, on that. And it was one of those things because, like you, you know, like if you're, if it was a pinfall and it was an accident, it, there is that's too bad. It's too late. It's too much. Too bad. Yeah. If you counted the three. You can't change the finish. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. But I mean, you can even work some with something like that. That should have been like, and I'm surprised because they want the fucking referees. To shoot like it's a it's a shoot because exactly it just makes it more fucking real, you know. But if they shot, I didn't see that. How come I didn't hear about that? Uh, yeah, I don't know. I mean, it, I remember it disappeared really quickly, but it was everyone was talking about it for a minute. Really? But I just remember it was just like a it was a great match. Was yeah, it, it was, uh, it was, it was on whatever pay per view was around. Um, the, was it uh, an Extreme Rules or something? It might have been Extreme Rules. It was while it been, while they were in Tropicana. I'm yeah, fucking, and it was, I gotta Google it was, that, man. I got right Google around that. when, when AEW did the uh, stadium stampede for this so, year. So Charles would have done the match, right? Which, which I, don't, I don't remember. It, let me let me. It's look tough it because they were on ref number two by two. this point. They had already knocked out the first one. Well, that's what I'm wondering. If Charles didn't, he, did they save him to run in, or did they save? Did they have Charles do the title match, and then? I gotta go. Yeah. yeah, I gotta check that out. I wish I remembered off the top of my head, but at this moment, I can't remember who was refing that or if it was somebody I even know by the second wow. ref point. Wow! But I, I can't. It stood it out game. because well, it is know, always done like a shoot. <laughs> well, you're right, and you know how smart our fans are. You know, like you know, everybody's smart to the business, so it's not like who are you gonna fool? You know what I'm saying? I mean, completely. <laughs> if. And the referee was trying to open the key, or one of them. Uh, Paul, Paul Heyman, I think, was trying to yeah. unlock the the keys. Okay, and couldn't do it. But they had Roman was in a really weird position. Couldn't get the key in the lock for the handcuffs because it was to a piece of rigging. So was he slow on his count too? Like one, or is he fast on his count? I couldn't. I think he was a bit slow trying to. Give him time. Thinking that he's still going to, yeah, thinking he's still going to get him out. And it was yeah, a good, like, 25 seconds till. What? Ah, oh, that's. Yeah, sad. he cool. finally it got him. Forever. No shit. Yeah, I want to try and find who is actually yeah. officiating well, that one. Damn, I, well, I can't. Isaac that looks either. that up. I have the most irrelevant question of the day. Yeah, what's up, Dozer? Saucer gravy. Sa <laughs> Saucer gravy? <laughs> You're from Jersey. You. It's e Italians either have red sauce or gravy. Oh, 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 sauce or gravy. I'm sorry. <laughs> Shit. We have gravy. We have gravy. Okay. I'm a sauce so, family. So yeah. and then, you know what? That's you know, it's funny because I'm I'm half Italian, quarter Polish, quarter Lithuanian. So my family's, you know, some of my Italian family in the Kinzano side, you know, they used to call it sauce. This one called it gravy. It's real real yeah. weird with that. But yeah, I, I love some gravy or some sauce <laughs> over some squinjil galamad and all that other stuff. Ooh, man. That's that, sure. that sounds good. Oh, God. <laughs> what the Delicious. hell does that mean? <laughs> <laughs> he's, from, uh, he's from Ohio. Yeah, I'm, I, I, I live in Columbus, Ohio. They, they, put uh, fucking, <laughs> yeah, they put chili on spaghetti there. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I know. I know. Uh, funny. Um, what was... I'm curious as to the, the, the difference uh, 
and the and just like the the production and what goes on in house shows versus TV production, as far as like whether you have as much going on in your ear, if it's a lot, yeah. just sort of like go and do your thing, and like it's more to live events are so much cooler, bro. I mean, it's just because the stressful point about doing the main events too for all the years I've done them on on Monday Night Raw on SmackDown um, is you're going off the air. See, now it's like, and you still, when you're on Monday Night Raw and SmackDown, you know, you still got to hit your cue for going off the air. That's the mm -hmm. most stressful fucking thing. Live events, man, you go out and you work four sides of the ring as a referee, have fun, a lot better, because TV's a referee only works three sides of the ring, if you ever noticed that. A referee should never turn her back or, or work in front of the mm -hmm. ring at the front of the hard camera. That's a no no. So you have to work three sides of the ring and never turn, never cross the hard camera in front of the talent with your back to the hard camera. Mm -hmm. So, but live events are so much, they're a lot more fun. You have, you know, TVs, you're there from fucking like 11 to 12 to 12 midnight, 11 30 sometimes, you know? So you're the first ones that you had to get there early and you're leaving early. So, um, you, you go there, you take your drug test sometimes, you go to catering, you go over your matches, the production meeting comes out, whatever, you know. So, um, TVs are long days, especially when we used to do like Sunday pay per view, Monday, yeah, raw, Tuesday, SmackDown tapings. But now it's a little different. So, now it's just like TV on Friday, do a house show Saturday and Sunday, go home, you know, yeah. So, in the house shows, live events are going to go away, I, I'm pretty sure. So, at some point, yeah. And and was the because I know like basically for a long while you know they were taping all the pre-taping all the smackdowns was it a little bit uh, less intense of a vibe as as far as that goes compared to like Monday Night Raw the pay-per-views or was it still like the same intensity level? Um, I'd, I'd have to say at some point in the years when Rock had SmackDown and and so forth with other things and with other talent SmackDown. It was definitely, definitely a lot well, a lot less. They put more money and more push into Raw. You know, yeah. Raw was our baby. Raw is Vince's baby. Yeah. That's what he's you know always heard because sometimes Vince would just be at Raw and he wouldn't even be at SmackDown. You know? Hmm. So what does that tell you? You know? Yeah. <laughs> so yeah. I mean, you know, Raw had the most boom boom with the fireworks in the beginning and all that stuff. And you know, the grand entrance of opening up the show, you know, with Raw. And then SmackDown had a very smaller entrance, you know, not a not as big stage, not as a big, you know. So I mean, it was I, truly set up like a B show. Exactly, exactly. Yeah, of the TVs, you know. Yes, of the TVs. So. But speaking of obscure TV shows, how was refereeing Shotgun Saturday Night in those oh, weird I, venues? I fucking <laughs> miss that man. God, you you want to talk about getting fondled? <laughs> shit, man, these bras used to grab your balls, your ass, and shit. Oh, oh fuck joy, yes, man. dude. Fucking, I'm like, what the hell? Fuck? Yeah. I'm like, you know, what the fuck? I'm like, I'm getting fucking grabbed on my ass and my fucking crotch. And I'm like, you know, I'm laughing with the boys. We start the show. This is how fucking funny this was. It was to, in, you know, of course, in New York City, Webster Hall, or we used to do these other shows and in, in the in them <laughs> towns, um, all the cool fucking nightclubs. So back in the day, and then uh, so we used to be there like fucking early. So they'd say you gotta set the ring up early by three o'clock, and then the bar doesn't close till like fucking four or five in the morning in New York. So we couldn't start tearing down till like six in the morning. <laughs> 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 so I, fucking half the time, boy, I'd be fucked up by like three o'clock because the show <laughs> went from like 20, 12 to one. Yeah. And we go out and start drinking and shit like that. And then we we're like, holy <laughs> fuck. And we were going to drive it back about an hour and a half back to South Jersey. Like, fucking. <laughs> oh, <laughs> shit. But yeah. uh, when yeah, I lived was... in New York, it was very easy. I would get out of work, yeah. uh, you know, in the, in the restaurants, one o'clock, two in the morning. And yeah, you could drink till the sun came up, man. Yeah, it was it easy. Can. And I mean, Carmine's was cool too, man. Carmine's an Italian place over there. It was a good place to eat yeah. in the city. But we used to go to Scores a lot, man, too. Back then, Scores was the place. Ooh, man. Um, I remember. Place. I remember as a kid listening to Howard Stern in the morning and being like, 
I want to live at scores when I grow up. <laughs> I was like, this sounds like the most amazing place in Brother, the whole universe. I, I, I want to tell you a quick story coming up from scores. I live in South Jersey. I actually lived in Burlington, which was next to Willingboro, and I built another house in Burlington. And so I'm coming up from scores, man. It must have been about exit. I think it was about exit nine or nine A or something. I had to take like exit five. You know, so I'm on a Jersey Turnpike going south. And I was so fucked up, bro. I get pulled over, and I had my TNT fucking World Wrestling Federation jacket on. I get out, and they they said, "Get step out of the car." All I remember is just fucking like kind of stumbling into the fucking second lane of the turnpike, kind of like stumbled in the first lane, boom boom, <laughs> tripped and fell. These state troopers, now this is Jersey state troopers. I'm not, if you know, these guys are dressed <laughs> like fucking military all the time. Yeah, oh yeah. They got well, the next, jack boots and everything. The next time, I, next thing I know, I fucking woke up at some hotel up the next exit. My car is impounded and I got no tickets with me, but my luggage is with me. I'm in a fucking hotel room and then I get, I have a fucking card and there's a note saying, call. What was it, Clem? Uh, <laughs> Sergeant Trooper Clem, and yes. fuck, hold on. It was a the other guy was a Polak. I know that because <laughs> I'm part Polish. Uh, <laughs> Clem and fucking somebody else. Clem they, is they knew. Sheriff's we, name. we know this is state troopers now, bro. They, <laughs> are, no, I just. I thought I was waking up in jail because I woke up and I'm like, what the fuck am I doing in a hotel? I'm like, the last thing I kind of know is getting pulled over and fucking next thing you know, man, they didn't give me no tickets. They were big fans. They knew who I was. You know, they love wrestling and fucking no tickets. And then I go get my fucking car from impound and they said the state paid it. The state paid for the fucking hotel room. <laughs> like, I'm like, um, I come down to check out. I'm like, um, I called, I called this place where my car was, you know, and I called them guys the next fucking day, and I said, man, thank you very much. Yeah. I wound up sending them a box of T-shirts. They got tickets for me for, like, years. For yeah, years. I bet. For That's years, awesome. <laughs> for Jersey years. don't pay for shit, so yeah. Boy, brother, right? So, I mean, <laughs> yeah, the, probably the only other time those guys got paid is when Christy paid them to shut down the fucking bridge. <laughs> uh, <laughs> right? Right? Ain't that the fucking truth. <laughs> But, uh, you know, I could, damn, I can't remember that. I remember, I always remember his other name too, but yeah, man, I, I had, they had free tickets for a long time, man. Yeah, I just couldn't believe it. I'm thinking all the times I've gotten in trouble as a kid and I, I couldn't have fucked up more that night. Right. And it was yeah, just man. like four or five in the morning, four 30 in the morning, you know, because the show gets over at 11, you know, by the time we were at school, we were drinking it for three or four <laughs> hours. I'm like, Fuck, I'm going home, you know? <laughs> Someone's looking out for you, man. <laughs> uh, were there? I'm curious. Were there? Was there like one match that you really wish you could have refereed that you had that you had to watch? Yeah, yeah most definitely, man. Um, I definitely wish you know Charles Robinson had this match, and this was the first match and set up between Undertaker and Shawn Michaels. Um, the first one. Yep. I would. I really wish I could have done that match. It's a great match, one, yeah, you yeah. know. Um, I do say I wish I could have done the match Joey did with Bulldog and uh, you know, Birthday Man Hart with 82,000 people in London, so because right. those fans were nuts, man, they were fucking nuts throwing at the horns and having yeah. uh, three and 40,000 people going hit man, <laughs> having the horns were going off on the other side and going Bulldog. It was just <laughs> it was fucking intense, man, That's you know. Awesome. So, but yeah, I'd say them those two matches. At yeah. Least, you know. Yeah, I think that's a. Is there is there a match that you remember doing that you're like, I really wish I was not associated with that one <laughs> at all, and be like, man, I hope they scrubbed that one off a of peacock. <laughs> yeah, um, it's probably a match. God, it was. Um, who was it? I think it was in Long Island that Coliseum. The, the girls. It was kind of a girls' night pay per view. They worked, they worked hard and everything. I think it was Becky Lynch and Charlotte. And it was kind of like, fuck, they caught me doing everything. Moving a chair over to fucking Becky. You know, because she was selling real hard. You're talking about evolution, right? Yeah. Like all women, yep. 
Yes, yes. Okay. That's, that's one of them, but there's other worse ones than that. But I got to say, like, because they caught me and everything, like when I was holding her bra up, when she was jumping off at this under the table. And I'm like, why the fuck did they shoot all that? Because we went over it in rehearsal and they weren't supposed to shoot it. But it just made it look so stupid because there was like three or four things I had to do for the girls that we knew if they didn't get done and they wanted me to definitely protect them and help them hold her hold her bras. She, they, she had her on the corner of the turnbuckles and went off the table. And I had a whole, you know, it's just, but they caught everything. And it was, that was a camera fuck up that night. But yeah. It made me yeah, look yeah. like shit. <laughs> yeah, those, those moments are, yeah, it's especially when... <laughs> It's uh, it's just an angle, and you're like, come on, man! Yeah. <laughs> like, Kevin Dunn, what the fuck, man? You you switch camera angles forty times a second. You couldn't <laughs> have switched for that second. <laughs> right. <laughs> uh, I remember who was it? To uh, God, who's the guy that worked the Kurt Angle's gimmick, the uh, the tag team with the two young brothers? Sh- Shelton, Shelton, Shelton no, and not Charlie Haas. No, not Shelton, Charlie Haas. The ones after them, the younger guys. Just not a few years ago. Uh, oh, oh, oh. American, American Alpha. Alpha. Yes. Yeah. Just, yeah. Yeah. Jason Jordan and I can't remember. The Chad other. Gable. Chad Gable. Gable. And he's a hell of a worker. Gable's you know? great. He's a he, great, great worker. Great, and I, very entertaining. And, and it was funny because, right. And he worked with the, uh, the English guy on NXT with the red hair. He's a hell of a little worker, too, in his own way. He had the red mustache, the red hair, Irish guy. Seamus. Oh, English. English, not Seamus. No, no, uh, 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 Jack, 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 Jack Gallagher. Gallagher, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. So real oh, quick, here on the story, they had a fantastic match. So it was like a main event thing on NXT. You know? Chad, I mean, Chad Gable was coming back and going on his own pretty much, you know? And um, I remember fucking counting them out, I'm counting, and I'm counting in the ring, and I'm like, and they're taking it, we're almost going home. And then fucking, you know, he's selling on the floor, Gallagher and Gable. Gable gets up on five, six. Gallagher fucking laying there at seven. And I'm like, hey, get the fuck up. Get up. You know, and I'm like, <laughs> hey, I'm like, hey, get the fuck up here. Nine. And he's like looking at me. And I'm like, what the fuck's his problem? He just, and he jumps up and he lays on the outside the ropes on the end of the apron. And I'm like, I looked at him and went, 10. He goes, what the fuck? I'm like, you got to get inside the fucking ropes. <laughs> <laughs> you got inside the fucking ropes. And they're like, he's running around and like, oh, shit. He's like, Kyoto, no, don't start. I, I rang the bell already. What the fuck do you want me to do? He goes, restart the match. I'm like, restart the fucking match. Are you fucking out of your mind? I can't restart this match. I'm like, I counted you out. You know, how are we going to do this? I made the mistake. <laughs> <laughs> was, it, was it DiBiase Jr.? That referee is trying to fuck on me. Yeah, right, right, right. <laughs> and I'm like, what the fuck? Oh, wow, I, couldn't, I couldn't believe it, man. I'm just like, and I felt so bad. They had such a fucking teardown-ass match. We were 18 minutes in the match. We had like three minutes to go home. And I'm like, what the fuck? He goes, it's my fault. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I didn't. I, I'm sorry, mate. <laughs> I'm just oh, like man. that. Oh, bad. But that's that's that that kind of that kind of shit even depresses me because I'm like, fuck. These guys work so hard, but I had yeah. to do what I had to do because it'll look stupid. Yeah. You know. Yeah. You have you have your job to do, and like. Yeah. I mean, it was just like he literally came up on nine and a half, and he just laid on the, and he like took his hand. Held the rope and then he laid back on the edge, got an apron. And I'm looking, I'm going, What the fuck? Damn, <laughs> Damn it. <laughs> and I'm like, Count out. <laughs> you know? And then both uh, these guys are like, Let's start the match. We start the match. Are you fucking kidding me? Yeah, no, that's you. It just ended, man. It just, uh, it just ended, man. <laughs> oh, man. <laughs> that's why I'm surprised on that count. You know, like, I, if I was counting, I'd have counted 10. Yeah, yeah, that was the thing, and that was at uh, the Royal Rumble 2021. I still haven't been able to find out who the referees were because I I actually want to listen to what you're saying. There's no uh, good database of who refs what matches, sadly. But yeah, so if you go back and you check out the the last man standing match, yeah, and you and you skip to the end and and the Royal Rumble from 2021, um, yeah, you'll see, and it was it was 
which is really awkward because the way they they had handcuffed Roman Reigns to the bottom of a like a scaffolding or something. Wow! Yeah. And like, Paul I'll Heyman, Thunderdome. Yeah, and, and Heyman yeah. was supposed to use the key, but the way that they was cuffed, the key was on the back on the inside, right? And so he couldn't reach it easily, and it just was like, what do we do? And it just was like one of those things. You're like, <laughs> I, it it felt like you know there should have been. The counting, or if at, at the very least someone should have smacked the referee enough to make him fall down. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, like, I mean, done some, somebody yeah. do something. You know, especially like, you considering know. it was you know Paul Heyman was out there who should. There was enough people who were smart enough and been around long enough to know to do something. Yeah. Right. Either yeah. just bump the second referee, knock him the fuck out, you know, and do something else, and just get into something else and make the other referee come back out. You know, yeah, like, anything. Get up, come out of his cell. Yeah, but, it, was, um, it was an awkward one. But yeah, definitely. I'm sure you'll want to check that Because I'm surprised because <clears throat> to me, I would have told, like, if I'm in trouble with my thumb on my ass, I would have, you know, I would have been counting and been like, Paulie, get in here and fucking hang all over me. If it's mm -hmm. the last man standing or if there's no disqualifications, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. Then just, just come in and fucking grab me. I mean, you know how many times I've told managers, hey, get up here, get up here now. Fucking, I'm, you know, I need more time. I need you to, you know, get in and I'll stop you at the ring. Yeah. Right? And, you know, managers and Olsen and Paul would get that like that, you know? Yeah. yeah it so, really felt like just those moments where well, and that's none of the pieces was, came together. If Paul, because that's why I want to see that. That's why I want to see that. I never heard about it. I would have had fun talking about that on the podcast because, uh, you know, like Paul being a heel, uh, heel manager, what does it matter if you're, you going in distracting or hanging on the referee or you know what I'm saying? Yeah. That's gonna put the heat on the heel. Yeah, it's, you're it's, gonna, it's Paul Heyman. Right. It's not gonna put the heel on the ref, you know. I mean the yeah. heat on the ref. So that would take away the heat on the ref, which I don't get, but I like yeah. that. Yeah, man. Yeah, yeah, definitely check that out. Um yeah, yeah. I just have one one last question, really, and I'm just curious yeah, yeah. as to um, I know I mean you spent so long in WWE worked with so many of these people. Right. All these releases that have been happening in the last yeah. two years. What is like what's going on there? I mean, I don't know. Yeah. So much talent, like guys who are incredible workers. I know. I Daniel Bryan and fucking you don't resign him and then you Bray you know, Bray Wyatt. Bray Wyatt. I don't get it. I just don't I hear there's just I, you know, I'm hearing rumors they may sell the Disney. So, you know, if they sell the Disney and stuff like that, man, um it, it could be a lot of money. And uh, they're just trying to cut their roster. But, yeah, how do you get rid of Brock Lesnar? It was, And then, like, my buddy Ray Mysterio, you just, you know, he stayed in my house last week when they were in Tampa. Um, you know, he, he went to negotiations with Vince, and he almost – his stuff didn't almost work out with Vince, you know. But uh, he, he convinced Vince. I think Hunter wasn't going to sign. He didn't want to deal with Hunter. You know, he wanted to deal with Vince. Yeah. And like, you know, it's like me. Hunter told me like, hey, I want to see you go out strong in your career a couple of years ago, a few years ago. And I even moved to Tampa for better living, better beaches. And plus, you know, if I have to start working at the PC in Orlando. Yeah. And fucking, and I was hard. doing, I had surgery on my shoulder, rotator cuff and two bicep tears. And then um, I get fucking released during a pandemic. And I mean, didn't and you had just right. signed a con a new contract too, right? I mean, right. weren't you like I a mean, month a month into your new contract or something? Yeah, like a year, right? A year or two. Yeah, I just got a bump. I was off for like four or five months during the surgery. Total for six or seven, six, because I had two bicep tears that took yeah. the longest, and uh, rotator cuff and something else done. So uh, Dugas did it in Alabama, which is the best, you know, Doctor yeah. Dugas under St. Andrews in Alabama University, and. Uh, fucking get the call get released it was like what the fuck you know and i knew something was wrong because i was the only referee that got released and i'm like where the fuck did i get my eat you know like i was out for surgery in my whole career i took off three three months for an acl four years ago five years ago yeah and i came back early because shane wanted me to come back to do his match against aj styles in wrestlemania right yeah so you know i was supposed to be back in six months i came back in three with that, and I had a cadaver put in because I had a bad ACL for many years. I just wore a brace. Yeah. And I dealt with it. So, you know, to me, it was a fucking shock. And I'm like, they ain't saving money on my fucking salary. I mean, I was making good money. Don't get me wrong. You know, like 230 grand a year, 
working TVs and yeah. I didn't have to go overseas as much anymore. You know, uh, I did have to go to Saudi and special events like that, you know, but um, they got rid of so many guys and then Brock Lesnar didn't sign this one. Big show Mark Henry. I mean, it's like guys who, I mean, Mark Henry, especially, I mean, was, was a shocking one considering that, you know, he never worked any place else, you know, and it was Vince right. who made, made him, you know, like right. he, I mean, obviously he had his, his powerlifting career, but I mean, right. He, well, you know, you're not, you're not making millions powerlifting, you know? No, no. I found, I, I, I actually found seeing big show in a nightclub in Philadelphia. So he's a bouncer at a nightclub in Philadelphia years and years ago and before he st you know, started with WCW and he gave me his number, Paul White, right? You know, and so uh, I gave it to uh, Pat Patterson. I said, Pat, this fucking guy looks like Andre. He fucking has hands like Andre. He's big, he's long hair, he's fucking in great shape, lean, like not lean, but he's fucking great. Wow. Shape. That When that guy comes to us and I remember the night that we we're in like North Carolina or somewhere, and you know, Vincent, Pat Patterson, and all the guys are watching the monitors in their room and the Briscoes and whatever, and you know, monitoring what's going on with fucking Nitro. So they, you know, for the second seg, you know, from nine to ten, they got to switch up, keep the, you know, see what match they're going to put on compared to their match, so the ratings won't they won't lose the mm -hmm. ratings, and then the main event, of course, you know. Yeah. And so forth, but they always followed their show. And I remember walking by when Big Show fucking made his debut. You know, I said, I said, hey Pat, hey, excuse me, Vince. Hey Pat, how you doing, Vince? Hey Mike, what's up, yo? Hey, hey Mike, how you doing? Yo? I said, I said that fuck because I already heard it was seen on the TV somewhere else that Big Show made his you know debut. And fucking, I said, Pat, that guy never fucking worked out. And he goes, what guy? And I said, that guy, Pat. I said, I gave you his number, man, like a month or two ago, man. That, that guy from Philadelphia, the bouncer, the big fuck. Vince goes, what? What the fuck? You met him where? I said, I met him in Philadelphia like a month or two ago. He goes, Mike, that's the fucking guy you met? Pat goes, no. And I'm like, yes, that's the guy I met, Pat, in Philly at a nightclub off of Delaware Ave. You know, like all the <laughs> <laughs> you know, Delaware River, we had the bars, there's a bunch of bars and clubs. So he goes, are you fucking kidding me, Pat? He goes, Mike, we, we, he goes, oh, what the fuck? And then slammed the door. He goes, are you fucking kidding me, Pat? I'm screaming at Pat. Next thing you know, Pat comes out, goes, Mike, Mike, what the fuck? He goes, I told you, he goes, fuck, we had, we had signed Ogante. I thought you meant I, we already had this guy's number because I thought you meant this was El Gante you met. We oh. already had him signed. I just didn't want to say nothing to you. Oh, no. I said, no, Pat. Wow. I told you this guy looked like Big Show, man. I mean, uh, Andre the Giant, he looked like <laughs> the hair. So is this when is this, is this when uh, show Pat, comes to Pat, Pat had to start doing the Kiss My Ass Club and all Probably. <laughs> Probably. And, this is uh, along the lines of hiring the wrong one-legged wrestler. I'm serious, and he even has big show about this. He's he's even mentioned this before, you know, on his podcast and some things. Uh, so then you know, he was so fucking. And show came to fucking WWF the time or whatever. You know, comes to us and he goes, "Hey, yeah, thanks a lot, you piece of shit, for fucking giving my number to Pat. Or like you said you were going to give my number, and you know." And I'm like. Fucking Don't did. fucking blame me. Yeah. I said, no way, dude. I said, I gave it to fucking Pat Patterson. Let him tell you that fucking story. You know? Because he wanted, really wanted to make his debut on WWF. You know what I'm saying? Of course. Yeah. yeah. I mean, it's a big league. But, but yeah. yeah. So, wow. Man, I took the number and he, he threw it out. He said, he called, oh. he crumpled up the fucking I thought I, I thought I already had it. I we already signed him. <laughs> Wow, I th man! Because you know what, you did. People did get finders fee if you found somebody. You know, you get a finders fee too. You would get a finders fee, especially someone who's like, uh, yeah, like, like him. Yeah, yeah. You know? Wow! And look at all the years he spent there too. They fucking just—they didn't want to give him shit. They wanted to give him just royalties. I heard just royalties, and they can control that check five grand, ten grand. 
Yeah. Carly, Carly, 35 Carly. cents. I'm telling you, they could give you all that. That's what they can do. So if they just wanted to give him fucking shit check like royalties, Carlito was going to come back to the WWE, right? Great shape. I remember he was there for like um, two matches or something. Brother, they wanted to give him $10,000 plus $500 a signing thing. And they wanted him to do some signings and wrestle once in a while. It was like a shit contract, shit money. It was like a kick in the face. He's like, are you fucking kidding me? This ain't even a legendary deal. What the fuck is this? Your own deal now? <laughs> wow. You know, Legends deal is a lot more than that or something, you know. Or, and even those, I mean, for the most part, there aren't that many left. I mean, yeah. we talked to Godfather a couple weeks ago and he's right. he was like, I yeah, think I, I think he's like, I I think I just know too many stories. <laughs> yes. I love, he's still running that strip club in Vegas. No, he sold he sold that. I think <laughs> he's he done it three or four years ago. Oh, Cheetah, he? Cheetahs, he sold. Cheetahs, yeah. yeah. Oh, that was yeah. a good place. Yeah, he said he, he was like, Yeah, no, no interest in going back to that. I he's, he just hangs out and smokes weed and plays disc, yeah. go, disc golf and shoots guns. Good, man. Good. Yeah, Good he's, he's like he's enjoying himself. Yeah, I miss um, I'm I'm curious, what is, what do you have going on these days? You, you L-E-W-E. Know? We got Latin American Wrestling Entertainment, man, going on. Um, we're starting our first show October 9th. So this is what happened. So we were gonna set up uh and the clones and stacy the ceo of the company stacy clone they started doing some channel two i was in puerto rico quite a few times going over some stuff i'm going to be taking care of the ring production revamping the ring making sure it looks tv ready like i've done for years mm -hmm. um they're gonna have a nice setup and everything and um actually i'll be refereeing training referees there doing production and so forth other things in the company um now Eddie Colon and and Orlando Colon and Stacy are the, the CEOs and owners of the company. So um, Colon's got a big name. We're trying to bring wrestling back to Latin America. Carlito and Andrade are the the main event coming up in that show. I'll be refing that match. All right. Um, we got some good talent coming in there too. The Good Brothers, and uh, hopefully Alberto Dorito is going to make a little bit of a comeback soon. <laughs> So we you know some there's some good talent. Yeah, I don't know if he gets some things taken care of, but you know, <laughs> hopefully I see him working because he's an unbelievable worker too. I, I mean, despite all his his bullshit, yeah, I always I, know. I was always a fan of his work. I yeah, love I loved yeah. his work in Lucha Underground. Yeah, he's a good dude, man. He really is a cool guy, man. Yeah. He's got a temper, but he's a good dude. Yeah. But you know, um, so I mean, you know, we we got it, we got some good talent though, young talent, Mike Mendoza. And some good talent coming in. We might even have Chris Masters in and every once in a while. Hopefully he pops in and does some shows. And, you know, like Jake Hager, we're going to try and branch and get some other guys. And the AEW guys, remember, they can do whatever they want. So they can do yeah. whatever they want. They're not contracted. Like Vince contracts, you know, he doesn't let you do any other shit. So, you know, and it's, it's going to be a, a good new, it's a new beginning for Latin America. So what does WWE do? We, we're, trying to promote they were on channel two news stacy and eddie cologne and all this and we're promoting looking for the october 2nd so a couple of weeks ago guess who books october 2nd at the coliseum wwe so that's a good play by hunter and them you know it's a very good play i mean yeah i so, mean it's it, it, right. they're, they're, so, that's the, they've been their mo since since right. Vince took over is... right so i mean they never book a show less than two months away in puerto rico you know like that quick so um and anyway so i said you know what we we had some meetings we talked and said hey, you know what let's feed off of their, their crowd let's let's plug the billboards and the lawe Coming soon, coming October 9th. The pay, we're going to be on pay per view at Fight TV. And uh, this is a good opportunity to advertise our show in the wrestling. Yep. So, and Carlito and I think Andrade will draw a good house, man. So it'll be cool. They got a good card going on. Yeah, as long as you don't have to go and sell flyers, man. <laughs> That's it, right? That's it. But they're going to have that. They're going to have a lot of young girls in some bikinis or whatever, with tight yeah. shorts running around, passing out flyers. I think we got some big billboards, you know, LAW, awesome. there's some LED boards going up around the Coliseum. So and, and on Fight done. TV on October 9th. That's it. That's awesome. It. Awesome. So Any, those. anything else you want to plug? No, I mean, you know, my Twitter is that at, at MJC Kyoda, C H I O D A. And 
you know, I'm on Twitter and everything. Hit me up on Twitter and uh, that's it. I got some shirts of Pro Tees Wrestling. Pro wrestling saw you got some nice, you know, you got, got some nice gear up there. Got some decent gear. I got to change <laughs> it up. I got to get some new stuff. So, and that's it, man. But um, yeah, it's that's pretty much it. Bro. You got to you got to get you got to get the shirt. You know, with the graphic image of you standing over Jack Gallagher. <laughs> with, the ten, with the ten count saying what the fuck <laughs> okay yeah right i hear you man i hear you uh, thank you so much man uh, we really appreciate your uh yeah, you're joining us in the perspective um we've talked to a good number of wrestlers but cool. it's really interesting to hear a different side of the business especially considering you know how how long you were in it who got you into the business and right, right. everything you got to see in between. So uh, it, it was really interesting and really fascinating talking to That's you. And cool, I appreciate man, yeah. your time. Yeah. I would love to do it again. You know, man, it's, uh, it's been, it's been crazy. Like uh, all the stuff I'm getting, I'm, I'm going to be like, maybe next time with hopefully we we'll do another podcast, man. I'm, I'm ready to do my garage. Cause I got so much wrestling, cool stuff. Man. I like that. I'm looking at a big poster with, you know, ECW or Rob Van Dam 2006 and, I'm going to make my whole single car garage into a, a podcast room in a awesome. bar. So that's yeah, awesome. And that's, that's where I'll be smoking with you and drinking when I get the bar. Hell yes. <laughs> we would, we would love to have you back on when you get it all set up for you sure. Absolutely. It. Yeah. Well, thank you for having me on guys. It's been well, a pleasure talking again. To you, thank man. you so much for joining us. You guys, man. Thank, thank you. you for the board of all the careers. Is that a Pillman shirt? It is. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, it is a bride. That's cool. Yeah, I got cool. this one in one of the pro wrestling tees. Uh, yeah, boxes. So. Oh, nice man, nice. Yeah. Yeah, it was yeah. a wild one. He was a wild one. <laughs> yeah. yeah, incredible, incredible. That's good. <laughs> awesome. Right. Well, I'm gonna I'm gonna take a drink to uh, to Brian Pillman before we head off. You got it, man. <laughs> I'll join. Cheers. All right. Cheers, have man. Salute, have a great guys. night. Thank Salute. you. Have much. a great night. You too, guys. Take care. Thank you for listening to this edition of Such Good Shoot. If you are on YouTube, please remember to like, subscribe, and ring that bell icon. Or subscribe to us on your favorite audio catcher. Or finally, if you're on Facebook, leave a comment, like the video, and make sure to share it out to all your friends. Until next time, we have been Such Good Shoot, and have a...